get to you know put on our NFL draft hat because who knows these guys better than us. Uh, Tom, we're, we got a lot of different threads to pull on right here, whether it be uh, position wise or you know met expectations, did not meet expectations. Uh, to you, what was one of the big headlines or sticking points coming out of uh, watching all the action from the combine? I wouldn't be shocked if like 24 of the 32 first round picks are quarterbacks, receivers, and offensive tackles. Because that is that was very much on display at the combine this year in that those are, I mean, quarterbacks are quarterbacks. So they're always going to be very highly coveted. But wide receivers and offensive tackles are just an incredibly deep class on both sides. And you saw it at the combine, like everybody did good. I mean, and a lot of Kai, and you got to think too, like a lot of dudes sat out a lot of the drills, you know what I mean? Like Malik neighbors didn't do anything while he was there. Jane Daniels didn't do anything while he was there. And still you had all these dudes. Like if, I don't know how many of our listeners or viewers have ever checked out the relative athletic score, the RAS scores, but like all these dudes are scoring like nine, five or better, which is very, very good. It's on a scale of 10. So to see those performances was was really, really interesting. At the, but at the same time, like I have thoughts about different positions, and I guess we can break it down position by position if you want. But just it's important when you watch the combine to understand that while it's it's a really good display of athleticism and talent and ability, it's, you know, it's still just a bunch of dudes running around in tights. <laughs> <laughs> for the most part like watching them play football is always going to be far more instructive than watching them run a 40 yard dash so like like xavier worthy got a lot of attention this week because he set the combined record he ran a 4 140 which oh my god that is really really fast nobody talks about he, how he didn't run any of the drills that actually involved catching a football so <laughs> he leaves the combine and everybody knows he's really fast they don't know the concerns about xavier worthy so it's uh it's it's one of those things where you have to keep all of that in mind. But I do think that, yeah, like Amarius Mims is a freak. We knew that. The only question about Mims will be the lack of experience and the fact that he's been banged up a lot because you know he sat on the bench for a while at Georgia because they had a ton of awesome dudes on their offensive line. And then he was dealing with ankle injuries last year. And also I think he had some sort of hamstring issue after running the 40. Mm -hmm. So like he completed the drills, but again, that's another thing where it's like ugh can't even get through the combine without kind of, you know, a soft tissue type of deal. So that's a problem. But Joe Alt did really well. He is still my number one tackle in the class. But, I mean, there's a lot of guys. Six, just... eight, and five eights? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it is so rare for a guy to, like, be, like, that much bigger than his last, like, verified high school measurement. Almost mm -hmm. always it's, like, the same or the school list him as, you know, like, Texas listed worthy at six one, and he came in at 5'11". Yeah. You know, like, like stuff like that. Six eight and f that's that's huge. <laughs> so um all Dude, what's his I, name's wingspan was like eighty six inches. <laughs> oh what, what's his name? Uh Mims had like 36, 80. 36 and a quarter arm. <laughs> you could just stand like this at the line of scrimmage and like, all right, go <laughs> try to get around me. <laughs> I, I remember um at Under Armour check-in, like everybody like they get they get their gear to come in and do a little like media car wash thing. Uh Mims in high school. It was, there's a, there's some guys that go through there and you're just like Man, God has blessed you genetically in a very special way, and I really hope that you stay healthy for three years because that's all you're going to need in college because of the rule to just get out and go be a millionaire. Like you're just there are certain guys like whoa, that is not a, and we like even amongst the best kids in the entire country, there's some like oh, okay, you won the puberty lottery, like the puberty Powerball, absolutely. <laughs> Can we stick with uh, linemen because hey, Tom, you're right. Uh, I had Alt, I had Fashinu, I had Fuaga. Um, you got Waga tested a lot better than I thought he was going yeah. to, by the way. Kingsley, like, not surprising. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like um, Fuaga, when I watched him, it was always to me about power. Because, I mean, he is a very, very strong guy. And he's very, very violent when he plays. I did not expect him to be that smooth moving. So that was that's a he might end up. I mean, honestly, depending on what the Chargers do with their pick, he might end up being the first tackle taken. Uh, well, from Washington, fought new. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I Dude. was. Uh, that was that was that was pretty impressive along the way. I mean, what's how how do we look at this? Because Tom, I, I like the way that you put that. Because I had to run it through my head. Twenty four or thirty two, you would not be surprised if they're wide receivers, offensive linemen, or quarterbacks. So, I mean, Danny, just sticking at the offensive linemen, what were some of the the big takeaways from you? Have you changed how you sort of tier them out or look at that group? 
No, I thought they were strong coming in. I thought it was a heavy, heavy, you know, uh, OL wide receiver class, just like Tom's talking about. I think we knew about the wide receivers. I think the eye popping thing with the was the tackles, the size, the speed, the kind of the combo of athleticism. I think because again, we knew about the receivers. I think we had a feeling about the offensive linemen and the tackles that kind of really shined a light on them this weekend. Like people going, "Wow, this is a deep group." So I wouldn't be surprised at all, too. I, the number that's going to be interesting is how many quarterbacks go in the first round. Um, I was bummed the top three didn't throw. I get it. Um, and then from the – you want to you want to keep stay on wide receivers, tackles? No, wait, wherever you want to go. Well, I was just going to say, I thought there was, there was two guys that kind of went in separate directions. Uh, Penix wasn't a surprise to us, I don't think, because we've known how well he could throw the football – it's great to see him out there flinging. I thought he had the best performance out of all the quarterbacks, just the ease with which it comes off. It just flick of the wrist and it goes. The other one was a little bit surprising was Spencer Rattler, who, you know, had some post regular season momentum, runs a four nine five in the 40, which mm-hmm. is not great. I mean, I think that was probably my goal. I didn't run at the combine, but I ran a four eight and I'm slow. Like I was surp- I was genuinely shocked that he was that slow. Uh, at the a wind aided shout out to the track, you know? Uh, oh yeah. Mike long track for sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was a little bit surprised by that. Uh, Rattler is, is pretty much all arm. Um, like, like he's not a real athletic prospect uh, and he's mm-hmm. not the biggest guy. He's not tiny, but he, but he, it, he, 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 like physically he's not an imposing, you know, pocket style passer and he's not, he's not athletic. So uh, Slovis running the four or five surprised me. He, he didn't run a whole surprised lot. Surprised Everybody. Yeah, that I, I didn't know that he had wheels uh, like that. I bet you that surprises BYU fans as well. I thought Cooper Beebe uh, was that was pretty impressive uh, for for him to rip off the the times that he did. Man, tight ends had a rough weekend overall. Mm-hmm. Like mm. t- tight end is the I, I was listening to Tej Seth the other day. He, he, I think he's worked in the NFL and in college, and he was saying like tight end is the position where the testing metrics translate the most. And all of your stud tight ends in the NFL were absolute freakazoids as testers. So the tight ends just had a pretty bad weekend overall in terms like there, there's there's good ones out there. I get it, but not guys that you think are big time impact guys, with the exception of Bauer. So it's like Bowers and he didn't do anything. Are we gonna have a tight end in the second round? I don't know. I like you might, might I mean, like like this is not a very good tight end crop. It's not impressive. Uh, and there's so- the thing. Bowers could slip in the first, not because of the talent, just because I, about the need. I mean, look, Johnny Wilson measuring six six and a half, two thirty, and he ran four five three. Is mm-hmm. like, would you rather have him or would you rather have the second best tight end out there? You know, I think I'd probably rather have. And I know Wilson's not a tight end; he wants to be paid as a receiver. But you know, like that's, I think I know what I would do there. Um, Brian Thomas. That that dude made himself some money to to be two twenty whatever he was and to run four three was it four three three four three four, five three, three. Something stupid. yeah something like that that's yeah that receiver group is nasty and those tight ends just cost himself some money yeah the um yeah. the Brian Thomas thing was so interesting to me because we had sort of painted him as the less athletic like it's like Malik Neighbors is your burner Brian Thomas is your fifty fifty you know winner. And then he's like, oh, no, I'm still also just as athletic and as anybody else in this draft class. Yeah, I mean, Ryan Thomas is going to be a first round pick and he's been tra- like projected as a first round pick for a while. So it's not that big of a shock. I think the problem with Thomas, what concerns people about him is that in that offense, he's not running a whole lot of routes. They're not asking him to run many routes. It's mostly like vertical routes. But the fact is he runs the routes he does run really well which suggests that he'll be able to learn the other routes pretty easily if you if you ask him to at the next level, I think. Because, honestly, LSU just does a really good job developing wide receivers. They're all very athletically freaky, but they're also very technical, and they run routes really well, and they do some crazy stuff when you watch it on tape. So I wasn't shocked by Brian Thomas overall. I was a little surprised to see that the 40 was as quick as it was, but it's not like I ever thought he was slow. But I think going back to the tight ends, I thought Theo Johnson tested really well, but Theo Johnson is still the Penn State tight end. Is Penn State keeps continuing to put out athletic freaks, but there's still a lot of development as far as his skills of playing the position have to go. But when, to, to Bud's point, when the most impressive thing you see a tight end do during any of the drills was just tip Ryman's sl- bled, uh, sled blocking thing, that was the most impressive thing I saw any of them do. That's not a great 
<laughs> indicator of like, you know, tight end talent, especially with what you've seen at that position in recent years. And again, it hurts that Brock Bowers didn't run any of the drills, but I think by not running any of the drills, I think that was all Brock Bowers had to do is like, no, go ahead and watch these guys. <laughs> totally. The one thing I'll say on Brian Thomas, and I, I went back and watched his clips uh, over the weekend because of what he ran. His biggest games were against like the absolute worst defenses. And of course, like everybody's going to play better against bad defenses, but there is a bit of like a hot and cold thing here. So mm -hmm. you know, Georgia State, really bad defense. Florida, one of the worst defenses in college football. Army, horrendous defense, right? Ole Miss, really bad defense this year. Arkansas. Again, terrible defense. Florida State, he had the 80-yarder against the true freshman at the end. But he did have like 70 yards before that. So, like, that's against one of the better defenses out there. So, like, that's probably his probably his best performance against, like, a quote-unquote real defense. But there, there were games where he didn't have, you know, a lot, right? Didn't do anything against Alabama. Uh, Missouri, he had 66 yards, which they won the game. They scored a million points. So, clearly, like, Missouri was covering him or at least devoting some attention to him. But... I don't know. I, I would like to see him against some better DBs to see how he does, I guess. Not to pour overall. salt in a, in a wound, but if I was to take this over to the defensive side of the ball, we got a uh, blue chicken in the tailgate. Did Fisk, meeting Braden yes. Fisk, make money despite having alligator arms? And <clears throat> I thought Jared Verse had a good performance. I saw Kalen Deloach burning it up. Yeah. And not, again, not to pour salt in the wound, but it did make me wish that Florida State had gotten a chance in the college football playoff because the defense was loaded with dudes. I, I think Fisk's testing really helped him out quite a bit. Like everybody, you can look at the guy and see his arms aren't long. Now, I don't know mm -hmm. if we thought they were going to be that short, but the, the testing really was good. I, I think he's got a shot to go in the second round, potentially. He might be uh, the second or third interior defensive lineman taken. Like, it's like yeah. the tape is good. It's not a good interior D line class, right? Compared to normal, but still. Not great. No. It's still yeah. good. Yeah, like his tape is good. And then you saw him perform at the combine. It was like, oh, it's like, yeah, the arms are short. But if he's that quick, I mean, yeah. the offensive lineman has to get his arms on him. And you, you look at that kind of speed and explosiveness and it's like, oh, OK, well, shit. But um, I will go because I thought Florida State overall had a very good combine. Like yeah. some guys were. Yeah, but I can just let me let me un unload the clip here position by position. Okay. Um, <laughs> running back. There's still no clear number one in this class. Like you've seen in the last few years, you know, like you've had guys like Bijan and Jameer go in the first round. You had Travis at the end going in the first round a couple of years. Nobody's going to be taken in the first round this year. There just isn't that guy in this class. But I do think Trey Benson was very impressive at the combine, and he's also got good tape. So I think he could end up being the first running back taken. Shout out to Isaac Garendo from Louisville who had a phenomenal combine. Like he is not big enough to where he's going to get taken as a feature back. But he's got some Isaiah Pacheco to him. I could see him getting taken and being like a 15-touch kind of a game kind of guy for somebody. Uh, the wide receiver class overall, we've talked about a lot, but it restored like I, it, it was proof. It was proof of what I've thought all along on Roma Dunze. It was proof of what I thought all along about big bad lad McConkey. And also, I was very happy to see South Carolina's Xavier Legette do really well in the testing because he really does pop on tape. Like he is not a finished product by far. He's got a lot of stuff he has to learn, but just the clay. That was very, very impressive. I think he could go earlier than a lot of people expected. Talked about the tackles. As far as the interior offensive lineman, Wisconsin's Tanner Bordellini, my God. Like, Dude, where, yeah. where the hell did that come from? I don't know if he's going to be a center in the league or if they're going to put him at guard, but that dude was an athletic freak. I mentioned on Thursday's show I was really interested in watching Trevor Keegan from Michigan, their left guard, who did very well in the Alabama game in the Rose Bowl. He was, he did, I thought he did well in the drills. Uh, from what I saw at the edge, kind of confirmed to me of why I would take Chop Robinson over every other edge player in this class just because I don't think this is a very good edge class, and I think a lot of the scores that you saw from the Combine this week proved it. It's not to say like Dallas Turner and Jared Verse and these guys aren't going to be good or lay too lot to. It's that if you look at those RAS scores that I mentioned, since 2020, so the last five draft classes – only Chop Robinson and Texas Tech's Miles Cole in this class finished in the top 20 in RAS scores. And that's why I would go with Chop, because he doesn't have that production yet, but just athletically, I feel like the best is still yet to come. The problem I have with Chop is I don't know if he's ever going to be big enough or good enough in the run game. He could just end up being a pass rush specialist, but I think he could be a very good one, and those are very important. Talked about Fisky. I thought he was great. I thought he could play himself into being the second, maybe after Byron Murphy, defensive tackle taken. 
I mentioned Ruka Roro on Thursday's show. I thought he tested very well and looked good in the drills. I was disappointed by Alabama's Justin at Boigby. I didn't think he did very well at all. And I think he looked better on tape than he did at the Combine, so I'm not going to like completely dis- dismiss him. But it was, it was a surprising performance for me. Uh, linebacker, NC State's Peyton Wilson, man. The, Dude, the, on- the only it. thing there is health. And then he's the defensive Michael Penix. Yeah, he's just yeah. like that it, Louisville game he had was insane. Yeah, he's just everywhere all the time. And then you watch him in the drills and you're like, man. and then finally, I just want to say uh, to the former Illini great, my buddy Richard Mendenhall, he was watching that combine this week and he was shaken. Mm. He was <laughs> scared because I don't know if you noticed this, but between you got running back Dylan Lobb. Wide receiver Lad McConkey, Ricky Pearsall, Luke McCaffrey. We talked about Braden Fisk at defensive tackle, Peyton Wilson at linebacker, Cooper DeGene at corner, Cole Bishop at safety. Watch out. Just saying, watch out for the white guys. We got some <laughs> athletes on the come up. This team's going to get better. Spread is getting smaller. We're coming. <laughs> on running backs, um, I think some of these got, like, if you want to answer, like, were these guys a product of their offensive line? Uh, Audric Estime, Bucky Irving, Dylan Johnson. I, I, I think their speed score, which is sort of the measure of like how fast you run relative to how big you are, suggests that, yeah, maybe it was the Irish offensive line and, and not not Estime, right? Maybe it was the Washington offensive line. And like, they're, they're good backs. Like, they're going to play in the league. But whereas on, on, the, on the flip side, some of these guys who put up way more impressive speed scores who either had offensive lines that are either, you know, hurt, sucked, or both. You know, Isaac Grendo almost the opposite of the, of the speed scale of, of uh, Jawar Jordan. Like Jawar Jordan had the worst speed score of all the backs. Garendo had the best. They played behind in the same offensive line. Marshawn Lloyd, USC was kind of a mess this year. Trey Benson, same thing, right? I thought Tennessee's offensive line dropped off quite a bit this year for for Wright. And then Kamani Vidal, yes. Troy had like a legit NFL running back on their roster. And I, that that The fact that he didn't portal last year was pretty uh, – that was, that was good for them. For sure. Isaac Garendo spent two full seasons stuck behind Braylon Allen and Ches Malusi at Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. Now, given how good Allen was, and, you know, Ches Malusi was a, a, a competent college running back. You know, it's not, it's not, I can't criticize it a ton, but man, you had a, you had something special there uh, in Madison in that running back room. And it wasn't until it, like you mentioned, Bud. Not even the top. I mean, Jawar Jordan was the one who was like leading the conference and rushing through most of the season. Isaac Garendo just able to come in and, and drop, just drop game changing plays in sort of spot duty. Uh, an interesting player to watch throughout his college career for sure. Danny, any, any other anywhere you want to yeah. go? To? Yeah, let's go. Uh, somebody chimed in the chat and said, "Do I still have my Keon Coleman is going to have a better uh, career than Marvin Harrison Jr.? I'm not backing down from that." Uh, just because he, cause he referenced the four six one, which I believe was the slowest of the receiver group, uh, but he must not have watched the gauntlet drill or when they were running routes, he had the second fastest miles per hour. That's what I would like to call a football player who has football mm-hmm. speed. That's why I don't like I, I get it, too. Like we set a new record. But has anybody paid attention to John Ross and what he did, who had the previous record? I mean, if you go through the top 10 list, Chris Johnson was a stud. He was the second all time fastest. But there's a laundry list of guys who ran in the four twos, who never really did anything. And I'm not saying Xavier Worthy's not, I don't think he's going to be the next John Ross, but you like, it's so much more than just the combine. That's why I don't love the combine. I get it from a viewer's perspective and it's fun. And like Joe Milton was another one who somebody asked, like, will somebody take a flyer on Joe Milton? Scouts fall for this too, right? He has a cannon and he showed it off there. And somebody will see that and be like, we can mold it. But It's so much more than that. I want to see the tape first. How did you play with pads on? And I still think Keon Coleman's going to be a stud at the next level. Mm -hmm. Also, what what did Marvin Harrison run? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because he didn't run at the Combine, and it's been reported he's not going to run in his pro day. I I have never seen a confirmed time for Marvin Harrison Jr. that is fast. He's not a blazer. Like, as a high school recruit, as a like, – like, remember how Ohio State under Urban used to do like, like that fake wall of 40s? It was like clearly mm-hmm. fake. It was like, oh, you guys have seven guys who would set the all-time record on your team in college? Cool. Uh, I, I, we don't know that he's actually track fast. In fact, I think – like 
I typically believe fast guys run fast, right? They want to show it off. Marvin Harrison Jr. Might, now I think he's fast enough. I would take him first like, with with receiver pick, but you know, and I don't know that he's actually track fast. So it's sort of an incomplete comparison if we're just judging Keon's forty time, which was really disappointing. It looked like he didn't train very well for it. Right. But to Danny's point, it was it him and Troy Franklin they showed back to back. He was going like five mile an hour hour faster th- through the gauntlet drill than Franklin was, which we do see that. Like we, yesterday, I was at Under Armour Miami. These guys, some of these dudes just, you can tell, like they're they're not comfortable going the drills full speed. Like Blake Corum ain't fast. Blake Corum had the best looking running back drills for my money. Like he, mm-hmm. the cuts, everything is real fast. He's confident through it. So it is. Some guys are multi, like some guys yeah. ran track competitively right. from yeah. a very young age, especially, you know, Texas. I know it's huge out there. Florida, I think it's competitive. And Keon was too. a basketball guy, so he would not have, yeah. Right, right. So you're just not like- used to coming out of a stance. Like Illinois, Isaiah Williams ran like a four six in the forty. But when you're saying, Danny, when they did the gauntlet drill, caught every pass, reached nineteen miles an hour, which was the fifth highest speed, and that's while having to keep turning directions and make catches. And frankly, I would rather have a guy who can quickly change to turn his head around and catch a ball while running full speed than a guy who can just run really fast without playing football. Yeah, I think Jonathan Brooks is a really good player, but man, it was uh, illuminating when you start to go back and look at why uh, opponents played Texas with just safeties all the way back at the line of scrimmage when you got Xavier Worthy and A.D. Mitchell to worry about. A lot of space opened up there for Texas's run game in the short Coin pass game. Dropping rainbows Sanders. in between. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, – the Texas had themselves quite an offense uh, last year. Any other uh, any other thoughts? Let's see. We got the Florida State guys. Um, uh, Jared Verse made the right decision to come back to school pick up what I think we all can it, it believe is probably high six figures, low seven figures to come back for a year to Tom's point about like this, this being a pretty poor edge draft. Like I, I think he made the right decision to come back likely go what back half of the first round. We think I and, think at the latest. Yeah. Yeah. Did they, uh, did they all make the right decision to sit out the orange bowl and get ready for the senior bowl and combine where they crushed it? I mean, anybody who was even slightly hurt and like needed to get like a minor surgery or to like not tweak it again, to start your training. I probably so. Like Fisk was hurt. He yeah. actually tried to give it a go that that we could practice and then shut it down. Yeah, I will yeah. say it is it is interesting how if you look at the again going through the RAS scores, which are just you know just measurements of athleticism. Michigan players, the Washington players, the Florida State players all did really well. You know whose teams didn't have the greatest overall RAS scores compared to usual? Hmm. Georgia and Alabama. It's almost like the results on the field were somewhat indicative of the players on the field. I, Outside of Bowers and Mims, who are you really looking for from Georgia? Because that's part of the Georgia being number one going into 2020. Tyke Smith, Javon Bullard. I wanted to see them do more. They didn't do much. Uh, I didn't think Bullard would be very fast. No. Tyke, Tyke yeah, Smith was slower than I thought, too. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. I mean, Lad Bowers goes great. top 10. I got a bet with Dusty on that one. I said he no, could. I mean, he's if he that's the thing. Like, if he doesn't go in the top six or seven, he might fall down to 19. I, I don't know. It's really going to depend on what happens and how desperate these people are to get QBs. 